A counselor of our College of Physicians and Surgeons. Okay. And, uh, you. Professor Abid Hussein Mulla and yes, Professor yes. and Professor Dr. Jahid Hussein. He is the Pro VC of uh, our Bongo Bongo Sheikh Mujib Medical University and Chairman of Pediatric Cardiology. Okay, and, right, right. That's good. And <laughs> Professor Salam, you know him. Yes, he yes, is, yes, uh, yes. He was ex head of pediatric cardiology of NICVD. Yeah. And now he is working in Square Hospital after retirement. Okay, okay. And yeah. Professor Shahidullah, who is the chairman of neonatology, he mm. will join soon and he is also the president of Bangladesh Medical and Dental Council. Excellent. And all, all other pediatric cardiologists and students of the <laughs> pediatric cardiology and pediatric cardiac surgeons, they will join us today. Sure. The, uh, the, the, what is the structure of the pediatric cardiology training program, madam? We have two kinds of uh, formal training here. One ah. is FCPS, ah. or fellow from the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And ah. another is the MD, which is ah. from the Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Okay. These okay. two are for the pediatric cardiology. And hmm. for the car cardiac surgeons, they have also FCPS. And also they have uh, their MS. 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 Okay. Okay. Fine. The uh, we will be uh, delighted to have your uh, fellows in uh, pediatric cardiology, pediatric cardiac surgery, to come for a uh, brief uh, uh, exposure, maybe one month, two month stay. Yeah. Uh, and we will be able to uh, if we if we get sufficient notice. We may even get them the uh, license so that they can get uh, they can scrub up for the case. Yeah, uh, we can do that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. Already we have so many fellows who were trained from your Narayana help, and thank you again for giving for the invitation the and support and for the invitation. Thank you. We'll be delighted. <laughs> You are seeing your students, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nazmul, Lieutenant Colonel Ashfaq. They are the students of your institute. Yes, yes, I can see some familiar faces. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Lieutenant Colonel Jannat and Lieutenant Colonel Hannan. Many yes. of uh, the doctors from CMH, they were yes. trained from your institute. Yes. We'll be delighted. We'll be delighted. It's our privilege. Thank you. It's very uh, heartening to see the quality of echocardiogram, quality of the treatment in both India and Bangladesh has improved significantly over a last maybe 10 year period. Yeah. Uh, the echoes reports are very accurate. Yeah, very accurate. That, Thank that you. shows that the base level itself has moved up. Yeah. There is. And this subject has created a lot of interest among the new doctors. Mm. And uh, they, many of them are now trying to come to this subject. Yes. And yes. Awareness has been created. 
Yes, 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 yes. Good afternoon, sir. This is Lieutenant Colonel Ashfaq. Yes, yes, Ashfaq. How are you? So fine, thank you, sir. I was uh, at Narayana. Uh, I know. That... I, I was looking at your face. I was, I was about to say, <laughs> yeah. I was there in uh, 2011 and 12, uh, along with yes. uh, Colonel Nazmul, uh, now Brigadier Shams, and Nadim Parvez Ali uh, from Anastasia. Yes. yes, yes. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. I am Lieutenant Colonel Najmul. Sir, yes. I was in the year 2011 and 2012. Already, Lieutenant Colonel Ashfaq has introduced me. Sir, yes, nice yes. Be a long time, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Dr. Sajil Banerjee is there. Good afternoon, yes. sir. Yes. How are you? <laughs> Namaskar, sir. How are you, sir? <laughs> Fine, thank you. Good to see you. Fine, sir. Thank you, sir. How are you running, sir? Fine, thanks. Thanks. We are all fully vaccinated now. So we are waiting for the next wave. <laughs> <laughs> We have taken first dose. We are waiting for the second dose. Okay, okay, okay. What vaccine uh, you are using in uh, uh, the, the Bangladesh? Covishield. Covishield, okay. We also took Covishield. And now we started the Covaxin as well. And we are likely to get a Sputnik uh, vaccine, which will get the clearance. Yeah. Yeah. But but now Corona is running, COVID is run, raging again. It will be the, we will, uh, we will go through minimum of uh, three uh, waves, minimum. Because based on uh, the epidemic uh, of uh, 1918, uh, the, 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 the viral infection, Spanish flu, right. they had uh, four peaks. And uh, the fourth one was not bad. By that time, people developed herd immunity. We believe that this second wave, we all of us will go through. And then by that time, vaccination would have picked up. We may not find the third wave. Yes. But still, it will be there. Pockets of COVID happening here and there. But it won't be pandemic like this. Thank My you. only uh, hope is that uh, I am campaigning with the government not to go for the lockdown. Yeah. yeah. It will be a disaster if you go for one more <clears throat> lockdown. Uh, first of all, there is no benefit of a lockdown. We did go for a lockdown initially because we didn't have PPEs, we didn't have ventilators. Uh, now things are different. Right, sir. Our government has the same policy. Yeah. Sir, may I now not start our program, life. sir? Okay, sure. <laughs> Respected Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty, Chairman and Senior Consultant Cardiac Surgeon Narayana Health and Legendary Cardiac Surgeon of India, Professor Mohammad Shohidullah, Professor and Chairman, Department of Neonatology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, and President of Bangladesh Medical and Dental Council, Professor Dr. Zahid Hussain, Pro Vice Chancellor, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, and Chairman, Department of Pediatric Cardiology, Professor Mohammad Abid Hussain Mullah, Head of the Department of Pediatrics and Neonatology, Bardem General Hospital, and Counselor Bangladesh College of Physicians and Surgeons, Professor Dr. Abid Hussain, uh, Professor Dr. Abdus Salam, Head of Pediatric Cardiology Square Hospital, and ex Head of the Department of Pediatric Cardiology, National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. My dear colleagues and students, welcome you all to our today's uh, program on joint collaboration lecture on pediatric cardiology organized by Congenital Heart Disk Foundation and Narayana Health. Pediatric cardiology community in Bangladesh 
has a rich history of collaboration with Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty, a legendary and great cardiac surgeon of India, which was started in 1998 when I returned to Bangladesh from KSA after completing my training, and that was the beginning of pediatric cardiology in Bangladesh. I was desperately seeking for a surgeon to operate on my patient and got directed to Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty by another patient. And I came to know at that time that he was working in Monipal Heart mm -hmm. Hospital, which was situated in Bangalore. So that was the beginning of my communication with Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty. And since then, he is uh, acting like one of my elder brother, one of my guardian. And whenever I have asked for any help, he never said no. This was his uh, quality, which we should appreciate. And Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty is the famous Indian cardiac surgeon and entrepreneur. You will be happy to know that. He is the chairman and founder of Narayana Health, which is actually his dream child. And he has received Paddo Sri Award in 2004, Paddo Bhushan in 2012, which are the highest national award of India. And he also received Best Entrepreneurship Award in 2012. This is the Narayana Health, which is actually his brainchild. And Narayana Ridaelwai, it was the initial hospital which was founded by him in the year 2000. Now the name is changed to Narayana Health in 2013. This Narayana Health is one of the best and largest hospital in India, providing advanced healthcare services in over 30 subspecialties, including cardiac surgery, cardiology, pediatric cardiology, bone marrow transplantation, oncology, neurosurgery, and many other subspecialties. Legendary mm -hmm. cardiac surgeon, Dr. Devi Shetty founded it in the year 2000 initially as Narayana Ridele, I have mentioned you, and now it is working as Narayana Health, which is situated in the Narayana Health city of Bangalore. This uh, health uh, network has 24 hospitals and seven heart centers. About the Congenital Heart Desk Foundation, this was established in 2014 with an aim to spread information about congenital and structural heart disease to general populations and parents of the children suffering from congenital heart disease and to create awareness among them to seek treatment for their children, to educate our doctors and pediatricians about the importance of early referral early identification of the congenital heart disease to train our pediatric cardiology fellow and pediatric cardiac surgeons and students by continuous medical education program through classes, seminars, and workshops to prepare locally applicable guidelines for treatment of our patients to help poor patients by free consultation, interventions, and surgeries and creating job opportunities for the survivors of the uh, uh, congenital heart disease cases, and to provide all kind of counseling facilities for the adolescents and adults who are suffering or who are cured already from the congenital heart disease. So we are working with Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty for a long time about training of our doctors and nurses about treatment of our patients. And recently we have started a new kind of collaboration which is the academic collaboration. Here you are seeing the photographs of our students. Now they are working as pediatric cardiologists. Here is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nazmul, Lieutenant Colonel Ashwak with their teacher, Dr. Shunenda mm -hmm. Moheshwari, and also some other doctors from Bangladesh like Dr. Tarek and Dr. Tahir Anazin here. And here we are seeing uh, our another doctor, Lieutenant Colonel Jannath with Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty himself. So in addition to providing highest quality care to our patient, Narayana Health has been a great center for training our doctors and nurses also. Already we have trained 16 military doctors 
uh, in pediatric cardiology, pediatric cardiac surgery, and pediatric cardiac anesthesia from Narayana Health, who are now working mm -hmm. confidently in various CMHs of our uh, uh, Army Medical Corps. There was training of uh, nurses also, and we already had trained 16 nurses of Bangladesh from Narayana Health, and they had taken their training not only in ward management, but also in intensive care nursing, and also in OT nursing, you know, in the operation theater. Dr. Devi Shetty also has given us the opportunity to treat our hundreds of patients from his center. And for many patients, these are some of the patients from our center. And not only that, he also has given opportunity for pre free treatment of many of the poor patients of our country. So today, is it, a, it is a great opportunity to, for us to start our joint teaching and training program. Building on this wave of collaboration, I am pleased to launch the latest initiative, teaching and training for the future generation, for the future, future cardiologists of our country. We are very excited to officially roll out the joint training program today by Congenital Heart Disk Foundation and Narayana Health India. Thank you, Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty, and thank you all my teachers, faculties, colleagues, and students for being with us here today. Thank you. And now I would like to invite Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty uh, for uh, his speech now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Nurunahar Fatima. Uh, you have not only been a great friend for us, also you are a great inspiration. Because many times when our uh, doctors were reluctant to get into innovative procedures, I always got them excited by giving them your example of how with many limitations like us, how you managed to push the envelope of uh, pediatric cardiology to the greatest level. Before the conference started, I was telling uh, Dr. Nurunar Fatima, as well as all the distinguished colleagues of mine from Bangladesh, that quality of pediatric cardiology, pediatric cardiac surgery in uh, Bangladesh has progressed extremely well in the last 10 to 15 years. Today, we are in a position to operate on a kid or agree to operate on a kid by the sheer report signed by one of your senior pediatric cardiologists from Bangladesh. And that is the degree of confidence we have now in India about the capability of the pediatric cardiologists from Bangladesh. All this happened by the incessant effort tireless effort of senior uh, doctors uh, your country is blessed with. And we are extremely grateful to the government of uh, Bangladesh and the senior doctors for giving us an opportunity uh, in their journey to take the healthcare to the next level. We in India are blessed because of our close cooperation and activities with the British government because of the colonial legacy or whatever. We went there, we got the training, we came back with the experience and we try to impart uh, the, and educate our younger doctors with the knowledge what we have received. And similarly, the senior doctors from Bangladesh managed to go abroad, got the training, and they came back and tried to raise the bar for the rest of the country to follow. We are truly uh, grateful to all of the senior doctors for choosing us as partners by sending young budding specialists to our country. Our effort is that for us to one day say that we as senior doctors have been successful is a day when every patient in Bangladesh 
if he wishes should have everything required for the health care in your own country and this is what the dream we had for indians in india and a similar dream you all should have for your country no patient from bangladesh should think of leaving the country for the health care outside the border it took us over 30 years for our dream to come a reality in india when i was a young surgeon in england working at the guys hospital i used to assist my consultants for heart surgery in london bridge hospital or sometimes in harley street clinic and most of the patients uh, were from india today hardly any patient from india goes to england for a heart operation and the same thing is going to happen in bangladesh and that is what is important for us and for all of you because every country should become self sufficient so in your journey to reach there if we can be of any help it is our pleasure and my request to all the senior doctors is that any time you feel that some of your junior colleague or yourself wants to have some kind of a training even hands on training in any specialty not only in cardiology cardiac surgery even in other specialties if any one of you want please uh, send me a mail and i will coordinate your training program or a brief exposure by some of our star doctors who are extremely good in whatever they are doing so it is very very important that for us to have a peaceful progressive happy society every country has to become self sufficient and this is what we should aim for and this is what is our dream and if we can be of any help please do not hesitate to contact and once again i'm extremely grateful to the warmth and the love you all have uh, towards us and especially me because uh, i i i sometimes feel that maybe in my last life i was born in your part of the world uh, this is my second life back here that's a kind of a bonding i have and i cherish my lovely memories of the wonderful hospitality in your great country whenever i visit it and i am very very proud every time i read in the newspaper that bangladesh is progressing they are more prosperous they are more educated i feel very happy and proud extremely grateful to you uh, all of you and good luck and god bless thank you so much for the opportunity and i am looking forward to having similar interactions even in the future thank you so much dr fatima you are muted uh, dr fatima you are muted oh, sorry sorry yeah. thank you sir thank you for your inspirational speech for all of us and we are actually grateful to you always for your kind hearted support for our patient and for the training of our uh, young doctors now i would like to invite professor mohammad shahidul sir for giving his speech he is the Uh, chairman of neonatology bangabandhu sheikh mujib medical university and also the president of bangladesh medical and dental council and counselor of bangladesh college of physicians and surgeons sir thank you thank you uh, brigadier general professor nurun nar fatima our pride in the pediatric fraternity as a uh, very eminent uh, pediatric cardiologist for giving me the opportunity to say a few words uh my hats off to dr devi shetty who is uh, not only a great cardiac surgeon in india i would say in the globe and we are very proud of him uh having him in south asia i just heard from uh, brigadier nurnar fatima that how narayana health in bangalore 
is playing its crucial role in India and also in Bangladesh, imparting training to our doctors and nurses. I also like to thank uh, Brigadier Noruna Fatima for organizing or establishing Congenital Heart Death Foundation in 2014. And today, as I am very happy to see that Narana Health and Congenital Health, um, Heart uh, Death Foundation jointly collaborating uh, for this particular endeavor. Now, when it is uh, known that uh, this endeavor has already gone into a long way in joint teaching and training. And I see that once upon a time, we always thought that there will be a uh, north to south uh, kind of a cooperation, but south-south cooperation is very co quite important. And here, Narana Health and Congenital Heart Death Foundation they have actually given us the example of South-South cooperation. It is very important, you know why? Because when it is South-South cooperation, then the things are easy, simple, doable. And I would say that building capacity in our, in our pediatric fraternity is very important. And Dr. Devi Shetty is playing a great role for that. Dr. Devi Shetty visited Bangladesh several times. The last time that I remember that uh, he was uh, invited for a very brief period to uh, one of our that um, uh, minister, I mean, the uh, communication minister, uh, Ubaidul Kader. And when he came to Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, I was there at that time, but he actually admired the, the management that was offered by our cardiologist. And he said, everything, what could be done is done here in Bangladesh. And when this kind of a praise that comes from uh, Debi Shetty, that's a great kind of an honor that our cardiologist can have. So I will close my remarks that please go ahead. Let's uh, uh, all try to support Congenital Heart Death Foundation and Narana Health in their endeavor to make capacity building among the doctors and nurses in our country. And that will have, I mean, that will have, make a big dent in our journey of pediatric cardi cardiology and pediatric cardiac surgery in our country as well. So, I mean, I like to thank Professor Beginner Naruna Fatima for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your inspirational speech and all the inspiration for the pediatric cardiology population of the country. Now I would like to invite Professor Muhammad Zahid Hussain, Pro Vice Chancellor, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University and Chairman of Department of Pediatric Cardiology for giving his speech. Thanks, uh, Professor Brigadier Jandunar Fatima uh, for organizing such a mutual collaborative training program, online training program for MD and HBS students of pediatric cardiology, as well as other interested cardiologists, surgeons, and also I, will, I, sh I should say pediatrician of Bangladesh. Uh, today's very beloved personality, the founder and chairman of Naran Hill and legendary senior uh, consultant card cardiac surgeon, not only of India. He is the pride of Southeast Asia, and I should say he is a uh, li uh, limiting the South. I, I can say that he is a legendary cardiac surgeon in the world. And Professor Mohammad Shahidullah, uh, renowned neonatologist of Bangladesh also President, Bangladesh Medical and Dental Council, Professor M. Abhidhushan Mullah, Head of the Department of Pediatrics and Neonatology, Bardem General Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh, Learned Partition, Assalamu Alaikum. First of all, I express my sincere 
gratitude to uh, Brigadier General Nunnar Fatima, uh, who has pioneered uh, the pediatric, uh, pioneered in pediatric cardiology, to establish pediatric cardiology in Bangladesh. And uh, the legendary consultant pediatric doctor, David Shetty, who has developed the renowned Institute of uh, Pediatric Cardiology and Surgery in India. Many surgeons, pediatric cardiologists, also our students, from two students of Indian pediatric cardiology from our university have got training in Narana Institute of Haura, West Bengal. Uh, in Bangladesh Shekhmanji Medical University to uh, promote the development of manpower in pediatric cardiology. In our university, we started Indian pediatric cardiology in 2014, and already six students has already pa have passed out uh, from our institute. And I can say without hesitation, in pediatric cardiology, we had advanced very much. In combined military hospital, pediatric cardiologists have developed very much. Uh, in other institutes like Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, or Dhaka Shishu Hospital, they are doing very much well. And I want to mention one thing that in our all eight medical colleges, pediatric development of pediatric center, center project has already been adopted by the government, and that is also going on well and you know uh, centered the a, a bigger project to develop pediatric cardiac cardiology and surgery has also been taken which will be complete by three years and to develop pediatric cardiac surgery in Bangladesh I want to let Dr. Uh, Devi Prashad Shetty that Gauss uh, Ajay Shurim Khan I, I think you might know him we have recruited from our university to operate the congenital uh, heart disease patient who did operation, you know that all patients from our country, guardians of the patient who are affected by congenital heart cannot go to India. Because in Bangladesh, India is five to 10 lakhs. In, in, even in Bangladesh, I, I can see from my practical experience that 50% of uh, the guardians cannot afford one to two lakhs in Bangladesh, the cost of the operation. So I thought that this recruitment will help us. Uh, uh, the, we will be critically ill patient. Uh, he will be uh, able to operate in my center. And many, we have in mind that at least 20 to 30 or 40 surgeons, we, we, uh, we got uh, get the facility to be training under him. And yeah, I will not say more because time is limited. But we say yes, the collaboration and support from a renowned surgeon from you, uh, I can say that Bangladesh and India now running under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina and your Honorable Prime Minister like twin brothers. We are running like a twin brothers. So in developing pediatric cardiology, pediatric cardiac surgery in India, Bangladesh, with our mutual collaboration support, we will we'll be able to achieve, we'll be able to go to the optimum level. That is our uh, hope today. So with these few words, I congratulate everybody. And again, I uh, express my sincere thanks to Brigadier General Nunnar Fatima and Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty for initiating such a nice initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Jahid Hussain for your thorough <laughs> discussion on present status and future vision on pediatric cardiology and pediatric cardiac surgery. Now I would like to request Professor Mohammad Abid Hussein Mullah, head of the Department of Pediatrics and Neonatology in Bardem General Hospital, counselor Bangladesh College of Physicians and Surgeons, and ex head of the Department of Pediatrics, Dhaka Medical College Hospital. Professor Abid Hussein Mullah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Professor Brigadier General Nurunhar Fatima, Honorable Chairperson, Congenital Heart Disease Foundation, Bangladesh. Independence Award recipient 2019, renowned pediatric cardiologist of the country, head of pediatric cardiology at Dhaka CMAs, Professor Nurunnar Fatima Begum, 
respected Professor Devi Prashad Shetty, the living legend, the great cardiac surgeon of not only of India, but also of the globe, and philanthropist, Professor Mohammad Shahidullah, uh, the legend neonatologist of the country, and Chairman Bangladesh Medical and Dental Council, Professor Jahid Hussain, Chairman Pediatric Cardiology and Pro Vice Chancellor Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, Professor M. S. Salam, Pediatric Cardiologist, uh, and Square Hospital, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and Assalamu Alaikum. It's my immense pleasure and joy to be a part of this high level historical, I should say historical academic event dedicated for our postgraduate students in pediatrics who cherish this type of sessions in their minds since long. As you know that heart disease in children is mostly congenital and it is the commonest among all the congenital malformations of human being. However, despite its high prevalence in the community, the number of trained manpower in this field is very scanty, particularly in the country like Bangladesh. And as a rule, constraints are existing everywhere in case, in case detection, case referral, as well as management. I think this academic program will augment human research development in the field of pediatric cardiology, and that will reduce the gap in case management, case detection, and referral. In addition, we could have the opportunity to extend the existing cooperation as well as the exchange program between these two countries. And I wish that this session will achieve all these desired goals. And finally, I would like to express my thanks and gratitude to the organization, particularly Brigadier General Nurunar Fatima, to organize such an academic collaboration between these two brotherly countries. And thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words in this inaugural session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Abid Hussain Mulla for your great remarks. And now we are going to our Professor Dr. A.B.M. Abdul Salam, Head of Pediatric Cardiology, Squire Hospital, and ex-head of the Department of Pediatric Cardiology, National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. Professor A.B.M. Abdul Salam, for your speech. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Biyan Nuna Fatima, am I audible? Yes. yes, yes, you are audible, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brigadier Jan Nuna Fatima, for inviting me as a special guest in this August uh, uh, inaugural session of uh, Joint Venture uh, Academic uh, Program by uh, Congenital Heart Desk uh, Bangladesh and Narayana Health uh, India. And I must, uh, I, I am paying my heartful thanks and gratitude to Professor Devi Prashad Shetty and Professor Dr. Mohammad Shahidullah and Professor Mohammad Jahid and also Professor Abid Hussain Mullah, uh, who was also my teacher. And finally, to Brigadier Nurnar Fatima for organizing such an uh, 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 <coughs> academic uh, program between these two brotherly countries. And uh, on the eve of uh, this uh, 50th anniversary of uh, independence of Bangladesh, I like to recall the memory of our father of nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and also the ex-Prime Minister Srimuth Indira Gandhi. Without uh, their cooperation, we could not even dream this, uh, our this, uh, independence Bangladesh. So India and Bangladesh has a joint venture collaboration since our inception of independence. And th this is one of the evidence that we are again in the field of uh, development of a different uh, aspect, uh, including science and technology, including the medical science, we are uh, going forward uh, along with this uh, partnership. And I really appreciate uh, and welcome and say greetings to Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty, who is not only a legendary surgeon, he is a great human being, as well as he is uh, uh, an icon and he is a, a brand. Uh, personality in all over the world and his uh, modesty, generosity and philanthropic uh, activities has uh, increased his height in Sase state 
who is on, only only on, on can just dream so uh, i think bangladesh pediatric cardiac care status is increasing day by day uh, which he has appreciated particularly in the field of uh, pediatric intervention uh, but in the sector of uh, cardiac surgery we are lacking behind uh, although common surgery procedure are happening in bangladesh but uh, 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 neonatal surgery and emergency surgery like artery sweeps and so on are not available still in bangladesh in um, as much as required only one center uh, 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 is doing this uh, very nicely but we need at least more than 10 center so i will invite and i will request to professor dibisheti sir the i uh, i will uh, ask him whether you have any uh, vision or mission to expand your uh, narano health uh, facilities to outside india uh, particularly in bangladesh it will be very much yeah, uh, uh, helpful to our because many of our patients cannot travel to India, so they die without treatment, particularly those who are requiring surgery. I say that in regarding uh, intervention, we have uh, already established the milestone uh, by our pioneer pediatric cardiologist, Brigitte Nurnar Fatima. She has, she has performed the percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation first time in Asia, Southeast Asia. So uh, we are lacking behind during, uh, regarding this surgery. So I believe this uh, type of uh, seminar, symposium, and training program will uh, benefit uh, our fe fellow colleagues, junior colleagues, not only, also the faculty will be highly benefited because you know, uh, what the mind does not know, eyes will not see. So more practicing, more teaching, and more training will make us perfect. Uh, so we can give the accurate service to our distressed uh, congenital heart patient. With these few words, again, I want to uh, thanks to the this uh, um, uh, CSDBD, that is the Congenital Heart Dex uh, Foundation and Narana Health uh, 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 Group India, and particularly Professor Dibhi Prasad Shethi for joining us and giving us this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, tell some few words with you. Thank you very much. Thank you and happy. Um, uh, uh, stay safe uh, and uh, stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor ABM Abdul Salam, for your thoughtful speech. And now I would like to uh, say goodbye from this side, uh, this part of our program, that is the inaugural section. Before that, I would like to express my heartful thanks and greetings from all the Bangladeshi people on the eve of our celebration of the golden jubilee of our independence. So uh, we also, in this regard, we also want to uh, recognize and also want uh, 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 to express our thanks for the Indian people, Indian government for their support during our liberation war. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty for being with us. Thank you for your nice words and we are looking forward to meet you again and again and to get support from you again and again. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your nice uh, support always. Thank you. Sir, you are unmuted. <clears throat> sir, you are unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, the, the Professor Nirunar Fatima, for the opportunity. And I'm extremely grateful to all my senior colleagues from Bangladesh for giving me this opportunity and the love and affection you all have towards us. Thank you so much. Looking forward to similar uh, interactions even in the future. Thank you, Thank madam. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are going to the training session. And in this part, we have with us today uh, Dr. Amitab uh, Chattopadhyay. He is the senior consultant, pediatric cardiology, Narayana Health in Rabindranath Robin Thakur Institute in Kolkata. His topics today is how to identify suspect and and identify congenital heart disease. So this is a very important topic for the students and for all of us. 
So I would like to welcome now Dr. Amitabh Chattopadhyay to present his paper today for the students and for all of us. Dr. Amitabh. Please start sharing your slide. Uh, very sorry, madam. He got disconnected. He has connected yeah, yeah, again. Yeah. Just a oh, second. Yes. yes, Dr. Amita, you can start now. Unmute, please. Uh, Dr. Amita, you are still on mute. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Amitabh here. And uh, it's a really a prestigious honor to uh, tell you something. I mean, uh, uh, deliver a lecture or deliver a note in front of so many luminous dignitaries, especially Dr. Devi Shetty, sir, uh, Madam Brunar Patima, Dr. Salam, Dr. Zahid Hussain, and all the other dignitaries. And I'll try to be as brief as possible because today I'll be speaking on the what my topic is identification of the congenital heart diseases. How do we identify them in the peripheries and even in our centers and gradually formulate a protocol or formulate the problem so that we can help the patient by our latest form of treatment. So I'll go to the topic uh, first. Uh, Dr. Amitabha, do you, do you have any slides to share? Yes, that's what I'm okay. going to tell you. You can share, sir. Yes. My slides? Yes, yes. The slides are visible, sir. Fine. So straight away we'll go, how to identify and suspect. So see, in the, even in the year of 2021, despite the availability of advanced imaging technologies, a thorough history and physical examination of the core of evaluating children with suspected heart disease, and which emphasizes specific issues when evaluating a child with possible pathology, cardiac pathology. So what happens is in these cases, what we generally do, uh, suppose we are just like in India, I'm sure that in, in Bangladesh also, you will need to identify the people, identify the children with congenital heart disease at the doorsteps. So in India, presently we are following the programs, like when we, we want the people to be identified, our uh, special officers, they go from home to home, school to school, and from Mahalla to Mahalla, just to find out whoever is having some congenital heart disease. So they go and identify them just by looking at the sciences, whether the sciences is present or not, whether the child is having, I mean, whether the child is uh, uh, feeding well or not. They ask the questions for the mother to the mother and a, a possible with one possible auscultation, whether they can find any murmurs or not. So these are the main things which they do when which they are doing right at the moment. So history and physical examination and this shown this study was done by Hoffman and Christensen in 1978, which showed that. By the about age of about one week, we can identify with the help of history and examination alone, 50%, almost 46% of the children, with uh, whether they are suspecting, they, whether they are having any congenital heart disease or not. By the age of one year, we can identify about 88.3%. And by the age of four years, we can identify almost 100%, that is 98.9 and 98.8% of the people with history and clinical examination alone. Now it is we have, we are, so, I mean, we are lucky to have so much of uh, investigations like echocardiogram, ECG and X-ray. And previously, just before this era, we'll just take a look back what would have happened about say 40 or 50 years back. It was found that the diagnosis are made or confirmed by at autopsy 23.9% at operation 14.1%. Just imagine that uh, a cardiac surgeon going for a surgery with the recommendation of a pediatric cardiologist who has probably found out a PDA or maybe a, an ASD, but that is a totally clinical diagnosis and the surgery has to be done by the surgeon with the help of this thing. And obviously even at surgery, they might have found some surprises as well. So some findings were found at operation, 
that is a 14.1 percent and after cardiac catheterization it was about 10.4 percent and clinical examination alone would have identified 51 percent of these uh, diseases so a third of the infants with congenital heart disease were discharged as apparently normal at neonatal age. So can you just imagine the kind of improvement Bangladesh has made or even India has made? One third of the patients with congenital heart disease were discharged as apparently normal, only to come back to the OPD or to the medical emergency sometime later. So later on, what is the burden? Congenital heart disease is the single most common major congenital anomaly and causing three to five percent of the deaths in the first week of life and up to 33% of the deaths during the entire neonatal period. So the need for identification of them has now gradually spread from the neonatal age group up to the even the antenatal age group, whereas we can we can boast of the luxury of fetal echocardiogram, whereby we can catch and detect that the, whether the fetus in unborn yet unborn fetus is having congenital heart disease. And thereafter, we can start the treatment as soon as the baby is born and in some exceptional circumstances we can start the treatment even before the birth of the baby especially in left-sided obstructive lesions so what are the factors which present influence the pH of presentation why this particular slide is included is that we have to know what to expect as the as sir salam sir said what the mind doesn't know the eyes cannot see so we have to know that what the eyes and the uh, eyes ears and all our senses has to pick up so what are the ages of presentation? Now, the timing of presentation is common. Uh, we should note the fact that commonly murmurs are present in the early neonatal period. Murmurs which are present in the early neonatal period because this is one of the commonest causes of referral from a neonatal unit. So, commonly murmurs in the early neonatal period arise from AV valve regurgitation or from a seminal valve stenosis. That is either there is a critical ACE or a pulmonary stenosis. Most newborns with asymptomatic congenital heart disease are asymptomatic at birth. And the transition from the fetal to the post into circulation is completed and thereafter the symptoms specific to the physiology of the defect become evident only after the tra um, uh, baby transfer, uh, transfers to the post into circulation. Now the diseases which present between zero to three days, the main factor which make them present in that age group is the changes in the transition of circulation. So the physiological consequences then be parallel non-mixing circulations and the, uh, the main disease which presents in this age group is the TGS. Critically obstructive serious circulation like HLHS, hypertrophic right heart syndrome, critical aortic stenosis, critical pulmonary stenosis, interrupted aortic arch, and obstructive TAP are also present during this period because either the, uh, I mean, they are extremely crucial and they have a parallel non mixing circulations or critically obstructive serious circulations. Now, between 4 to 14 days, the main factor which plays across this time is the closing ductus, which is a normal physiology. So, as soon as the PDA closes after the birth, the physiological consequences we have in obstructive pulmonary blood flow, either there is obstructive pulmonary blood flow or there is duct dependent pulmonary circulation or there is obstructive descending of the flow, there is a duct dependent systemic circulation. So among the diseases which have obstructive pulmonary blood flow, there is a duct dependent pulmonary circulation, the top, severe top, pulmonary atresia, tricuspid atresia, TGA, VSD, pulmonary stenosis or severe PS. And obstructive descending of the flow, that is obstructive, uh, obstructive uh, systemic uh, duct dependent systemic circulation is either a cooptation or high plastic left heart syndrome. And the falling PVR, if there is pulmonary edema like truncus arteriosus, which usually presents a little bit later at approximately, say, two to three months of age. Now, how the PD of prematurity and AV malformations? Now, what are the factors? Which are the diseases which present between two to 18 weeks? Usually, the main reason is the chronic low pulmonary vascular resistance. That is, after about two weeks, physiologically, the pulmonary vascular resistance falls. And the physiological consequences are that there will be pulmonary edema and the entities which present are AV canal, large VSDs, TFPVCs, which are non-obstructed, technology of fallow, mild PS, that is behaving mostly like a VSD PS situation, TGA, VSD with no PS, single ventricle with no PS, and ALKAPA. They can present at about this age. Though ALKAPA traditionally can present at three age groups, either in this newborn period or in an adolescent period or even in an adult period. So between in between four to 12 months, the factors are the time allowed for observation for more for subtle heart disease, whereby the parents are observing the child for more amount of symptoms. And the physiological consequences are either there is a growth failure or even if the patient might remain asymptomatic with no adverse physiology. So the entities which present at this age is VSDs, which are small to moderate, PDS, which are small to moderate, ASDs, cooptation, aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis, which are mild to moderate. Now, some of the diseases can present an unpredictable age of presentation. Obviously, they can be myocarditis, primary endocardial fibrosis, storage disorders, cardiac deficiency, which can present at any time during infancy. 
indications of signs and symptoms identification of the signs and symptoms so what are the major signs and symptoms what we delay what we work with now uh, uh, apart from like in adult cardiology the main signs and symptoms would be pain palpitation dyspnea edema syncope hemoptysis renal symptoms and other symptoms in children we have cyanosis tachypnea or labor breathing feeding difficulties failure to thrive sweating irritability and lethargy so these are the main symptoms which you look for in a a uh, child or a newborn which can lead us to the diagnosis now the history the historian in most of the newborns and infants are the patient himself or herself and plus the history from the mother or the immediate caregiver because the observed abnormalities in the appearance or behavior of the child because there can be no uh, uh, solid history so we have to observe the abnormalities in the appearance or the behavior of the infant and because an infant's primary physical exertion is eating so there is a main feeding history which should be taken the feeding history should be as quantitative as possible what is the frequency of feeding what amount of volume or formula or milk they are having at each uh, feed whether it is 30 ml or 40 ml what is the concentration of the feed what is the caloric content of the feed and the length of time to finish a feeding should be obtained for both the bottle and the breastfeeding infant if it is a breastfeeding infant we can ask the mother how long does it feed on each breast whether it is 10 minutes or 20 minutes or the child is feeding like a suck rest suck cycle and takes a rest in between so the usually newborns take about 20 to 30 minutes to complete the feeding and if you find a history if you find a history that the baby is feeding for about feed then we are sure that this determine and this is the second symptom which we need to which is characterized by blueness of the tongue and the oral mucosa most likely related to this cardiac or respiratory disease if a child has a central cyanosis then it is most likely the child will have a cardiac or respiratory disease children in shock also may appear cyanotic specifically whenever there is a decreased circulation but they may be due to venous stasis right to left intrapulmonary shunting or increased peripheral oxygen extraction acute cyanosis of blueness of the hands and feet related to are related to skin temperature like it is marmorata and is usually normal blueness of the skin around the mouth or other parts of the face alterations they they might be alterations in skin blood flow or massive blood instability and this is a normal variant now what are the constant and episodic cyanosis whenever we are studying cyanosis in a baby and we are asking the history we should ask about the constant episodic cyanosis and it is more difficult to recognize in the anemic patient with decreased hemoglobin similar levels of desaturation may not produce sufficient quantities of reduced hemoglobin which is required there is more than 5 gram per cent to be clinically apparent so we distinguish between the constant and episodic cyanosis like in most forms of forms of congenital cyanotic heart disease cyanosis is constant that is it is always present constant cyanosis means congenital heart disease with hypoxemia is related to either transposition physiology inadequate pulmonary blood flow or intracardiac mixing and episodic cyanosis may be due to hypoxemia related to hypercyanotic episode from tetralogy or its variants like tetralogy followed DORD etc now the differential cyanosis like the upper and lower body of a newborn all the much less common can be an exclusive clue like the lower body cyanosis with the pink upper body suggests right left shunting at the level of the pda due to pphn and the upper body cyanosis with pink lower extremities may indicate tga with an aortic arch obstruction so the lower body is perfused by the ductus arteriosus carrying pulmonary venous blood via the left ventricle to the pulmonary artery then to the descending aorta and the parent of the caregiver's observation of the infant's breathing patterns should be documented what is known as unlabored but happy tachypnea sometimes we all know that a happy hypoxia and especially in this covid era what what is actually the unlabored or the happy tachypnea often it is accompanied cyanotic congenital heart disease whereas increased work of breathing can sometimes leading to grunting which is associated with left left sided obstructive lesions or respiratory illness grunting with closure of the glottis actually provides some peak and is seen in infants who have pulmonary edema there might be intercostal subtracostal retractions and if the infant hasn't been symptomatic from birth even the first time parents may not recognize the mild respiratory symptoms such as tachypnea it always happens like for example baite amader amra shobshomoy jinish kori baite thakma didima ke wachin ki we always ask whether the family has a grandfather grandmother or someone of the like especially the elderly parents because they can catch the uh, tachypnea much more easily than the first time parents so this history is extremely important we always ask whether there is any experienced person in the family diaphoresis during feedings or during sleep has to be taken into account in countation and diaphoresis in this circumstances generally indicates that there is activation of the sympathetic nervous system or basically the child is in low cardiac output syndrome hence we have to take the history like this what about toddlers and preschoolers even toddlers and preschoolers are almost like infants and they have the history has to be taken up mainly through the subjective history has to be taken up from the caregiver 
in the history this group is largely observational and the symptoms may be somewhat non specific feeding and breathing symptoms should be sought and as the children become more physically active the inability of the children in this age to sustain physical activity is the main source of history to us for example koto khon dhore khelte pare how long can the child play and whether they can the child can play along with his peers whether the child becomes extremely uh, unhappy after playing extremely ex uh, exhaustive after playing these are the history we should take along with that growth and development history history of chest discomfort older children adolescents can give a verbatim that means they can they can themselves tell the histories but always respect the adolescents privacy especially when they are we are talking about the history of drug use sexual behavior and other personal matters children with chd may be symptomatic from birth and may not experience a gross change for example a child born with tetralogy of fallon he he or she knows that i can walk only this much right from birth so whenever you are taking a history later on it might be so that he might be telling that i'm okay and i'm fine because he has been that, that is the best career possible saturation or career possible exercise tolerance with the child can have so in these cases you have to be very very uh, fidgety and take the history as much as possible like from older children and adolescents we have to take the history of exercise intolerance exercise tolerance and physical activities signs of physical activities means there is persistence of new appearance of a cardiac right left shunt and in older patients a sleep history has to be taken because of paracetamol nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea with congestive heart failure one should inquire about the patient's comfort when lying supine in bed whether the elevation of the head by one pillow or two pillows especially in left side of obstructed lesions actually is clinically giving a betterment to the patient nocturnal awakening awakening and short periods of breathing can occur in heart failure with postural redistribution of edema fluid particularly there is pulmonary vein or mitral stenosis that is the typical history given by the patients that whenever you have such a symptom like amai gomba tik du tin ghanta baad ghum ta bhenge jay and uthe podiye because exactly what happens is after about 2 to 3 hours of sleep there is redistribution of the edema fluid they are causing some pulmonary edema and the person wakes up so palpitations are a common complaint in older children and it is most helpful to have the subjective description of the symptomatic events for example kiv jodi palpitation ni ashe they can describe it as a skipping of a beat to the sensation in the heart beating or the heart beating hard or fast in this circumstances they have to take that under what circumstances did the symptom occur especially whether the symptom was acid fatigue shortness of breath or chest pain and appear what was the appearance of the patient during the symptoms specifically asking about pallor breathing and diaphoresis whether they were sweating we have to ask whether the patient had a syncope and palpitation whether when during standing or while the patient was sitting whether there was a pre monetary symptoms so on and so forth chest pain at rest is a common complaint in adolescents and is generally non cardiac in nature but again if you have a chest pain then you should always inquire how did it start how did it go on how long did it last so on and so forth whether there was any location nature of the pain or if there is any uh, breathing movements cough or arm and shoulder movements exacerbating or elevating manners whether the chest pain was associated with exercise or like unlike like adult coronary disease uncommon in the chest pain with exercise is very uncommon in congenital heart disease unless there is left sided obstructive lesions like aortic stenosis or right sided obstructive lesions in critical ps and so on and so forth exercise induced chest pain may be found in patients with diseases resulting in significant left ventricular hypertrophy congenital coronary artery abnormalities coronary abnormalities in cardiac disease or in non cardiac diseases such as exercise induced even bronchospasm so synco frequent reason for cardiology referral which is amar bachcha eshe baje baje dai thaki ebong oggan hoye jay so what we the take away from the history part so, uh, we should always note the circumstances of the event and the pre syncomal symptoms are of greatest importance description where they are they were gone and what they are doing what they were doing and how they felt at the time of the event that akhon kemon lagchilo tokhon matha ghurchilo kina chokir samne kichu dekhte parchile kina most postural syncope will occur when the patient is upright generally standing it might occur in a warm warm environment after a period of long standing but will also occur in some upon standing quickly from a sitting or supine posture even amader onek shomoy onek shomoy boshe theke othar shomoy horat kore mathara ghure jete pare while standing after a period of intense exercise whether there was any symptoms of dizziness or light headedness visual changes feeling hot or nausea and the examiner should inquire about the presence of these presyncopal symptoms symptoms at any time also additionally you should take the history of daily fluid intake and caffeine intake edema and swelling edema is less common in children with congenital heart disease in children and adolescents because they always move about but the de definitely the location of the edema is dependent upon the predominant posture of the individual and upright if the patient is upright most of the most of most of the time may complain of swelling in their feet and ankles or shoes that are tight at the end of the day juto ta khub tight lage 
and if there is any younger patients who are supine most of the time they can have sacral edema or puffiness of the face and eyelids past medical and surgical history we should always signify the significant illnesses previous hospitalizations previous operations immunization status and symptoms of poor growth as an infant a detailed catalog of the previous cardiac catheterization and cardiothoracic procedures age ki surgery hoy chilo kono cath hoy chilo kina kono angiogram hoy chilo kina and presence of other congenital anomalies or syndromes and other illnesses in the chronic conditions especially immunization history and allergies likewise not only in the patient but also in the family prenatal and birth history details about the pregnancy details of the maternal health during pregnancy for poor pregnancy chik chak chilo kina maternal illnesses medications toxic exposures pregnancy related complications infant of a mother with gestational diabetes similarly the, uh, they can have the babies can have several uh, other disorders like tga mostly tga or even pulmonary atresia similarly the relationship between maternal lupus and congenital heart block is well known whether there is a mother has been exposed to any teratogens whether the mother has been continuing smoking during pregnancy which gives rise to small congenital lupus and whether there was in congenital infections which can lead to successive types of cardiac diseases like if the mother had had fever with rashes in the first trimester then there is likely that the mother might have had rubella which might have devastating consequences on the patients not only the heart development but also the brain and the other organ development use of illicit drugs which increases the risk of hiv with infantile cardiomyopathy the age of the mother like the risk of offspring with congenital abnormality such as trisomy 21 the if the mother is too aged then they can there is a higher chance of having down syndrome babies though to it, today we can see that most of the down syndrome babies are translocation downs but there is many complications such as toxemia birth defects or fetal distress and how low birth weight can present the parental insert because of generalized cardiomyopathy if there is a birth defect during the uh, birth they or there is a delayed cry we can find generalized hypoxemia uh, i mean in due to generalized hypoxemia we can find a generalized cardiomyopathy kind of a behavior in the when uh, when uh, ventricular walls the general age and birth history including parental monitoring should be taken a care of method of delivery and infants agwar score should be noted and especially the sciences color and perfusion status should be noted in all babies family history of detail if the female if a sibling has a history of congenital heart disease we should always like to go for fetal echocardiogram relatively especially siblings born with heart disease indicates a higher than normal risk for chd a positive family history uh, should include the screening of other family members for example if you have a long qt syndrome or a short qt syndrome then you should screen all the family members premature myocardial infarction hypercholesteremia leads to the lipid profile treatment lipid profile estimation and the presence of congenital heart disease in the family members and valve abnormalities such as bypass valve valve should always be determined in uh, cruciality like in hcm sudden death in a close relative careful of the evaluation of the patient's qtc interval on ecgs these are extremely important so here we stop for a break for the history part and there after we will move on to the other part review of the social history and the review of the system and the physical examination do you have any questions until now i would like to stop for a while after the physical examination as well because i won't be able to cover the whole thing within the short span yes anyone any questions until now or else i'll move to the physical examination am i audible yes you are audible is there any okay, question from anybody i think there is no question you can proceed right ma'am i'll go ahead now coming to the physical examination because today's topic we are dealing with that how do we examine how do we find out from the history and the physical examination part we find out that whether a suspect that we do have a congenital heart disease in the suspect that there is a congenital heart disease in this particular baby before we move on to the sophisticated examinations now first part on the physical examination we will now discuss the parts of the cardiac physical examination including the assessment of the vital signs which obviously involves inspection palpation percussion and auscultation and obviously while i was a student my examiners will all would always like to say that inspection palpation percussion and auscultation there is a fifth sign which is back calculation otherwise you won't pass the examination so the infant always uh, prefer to check the baby small babies on the mother's lap because what happens is we might not be able to follow the general routine of examination here certain deviation from the routine examination may be allowed because if we try to for example if we try to examine examine the uh, vital signs or other things of the baby during before doing anything before we are obtaining some vital information then the baby might cry so hence if you think the main component of examination is the stethoscope with the stethoscope and auscultation you do that no examiner will ever tell you that why did you do the auscultation earlier rather than inspection and palpation so we start with the vital sign assessment we can which we can assess from a distance as well what is the heart rate respiratory rate and the blood pressure obviously for the blood pressure we have to check the check with the manometer cuff heart rate and respiratory rate 
often changes in the heart rate and respiratory rate is the first heart which is the myocardial dysfunction. For example, child with myocarditis, the first thing to have is will be the tachycardia, pulmonary congestion or arrhythmias even before changes in the blood pressure occur. The respiratory rate should be counted with the patient unaware that it is being done and preferably while sleeping in infants. Postural changes in the heart rate and blood pressure should be determined in patients with postural dizziness or syncope. For example, you check the blood pressure once while supine and once while sitting and once while standing. You'll try to find out. Cyanosis, as we described during the history, it should be more than 5 gram percent or reduced hemoglobin in the capillary blood or in the central and peripheral. They, should, they can be central and the peripheral as we discussed and the closed diseases are acrosinus and cutis marmorata. Clinical detection is only possible if the percentage of the uh, desaturated blood uh, hemoglobin is low, more than 5 gram per cent. If the oxygen saturation is 60 percent, science is detectable if hemoglobin is more than 12.5 gram per cent, but not if hemoglobin less than 10 gram per cent. That is, 4 to 5 gram per cent is required for the detection of science. What we mean is, for, some, for example, if the hemoglobin is more than, uh, unless the hemoglobin is more than 12.5 gram per cent, the saturation of even 60 percent will give you a false impression that there is no cyanosis. So mind it that whenever we are diagnosing cyanosis, we have to have some sheer amount of hemoglobin in the blood as well. Um, it has been seen that an astute physician periodic cardiology detects that there is uh, cyanosis when the hemoglobin is less than 3 gram per cent, but others detect at about 5 gram per cent. Better to over-diagnose than under-diagnose, and the clinical diagnosis of cyanosis is inaccurate. Always remember that the clinical diagnosis of cyanosis is inaccurate because plenty of patients in whom we see that the nails and the blue things are blue may not actually turn out to be cyanosis because there can be an acrocyanosis or other causes of cyanosis as well. This particular point has been mentioned by M. Tynan in Anderson's Pediatric Early 2007. This is an example of a simple cyanosis in one of our patients where we found that the child was grossly cyanotic. Hyperoxia test. We tend to do this hyperoxia test in the peripheries so that we can detect that whether there is any corneal heart anomalies at the spot or not. Pulse oximeter is not always reliable, which is a random number generator. The right radial emitting air and after about 5 to 10 minutes of after oxygen is actually recorded. If the PaO2 is more than 250 millimeters of mercury, it excludes CCHD because otherwise the PaO2 cannot go up this much. If the PU2 is more than 160, CCHD is unlikely, except that TAPVR may present due to false, uh, and which is the false negative one. If the PU2 is less than 100, CCHD is likely because either CCHD or there is severe lung disease or high PCO2 is from the PPHN or persistent fetal circulation. Hyperoxia test 100% oxygen for 10 minutes if the PU2 is more than 200 and less than 100, possibility of CHD to rule out. Pathology acrosan is a low cardiac output. Especially the mucous membrane, tongue, and nail base, blue but warm, but it can be physiologic up to the 20 minutes after birth. Clinical irritable saturation at less than of 85%. Lips and nail base to be blue. For the lips and nail base to be blue, the saturation has to be less than 70%, and corresponding PO2 has to be like 32, 32 to 42 millimeter mercury in neonates if there is hemoglobin F, 40 to 54 millimeter mercury in the older infants. And total concentration of hemoglobin part plus degree of desaturation. The total concentration of hemoglobin plus degree of desaturation, it should be anemic infant, may not appear cyanotic, so and so. Differential diagnosis more in one extremity. The upper extremity has less cyanose, reverse flow through a large ductus, and lower extremity is less cyanose, TG, a large ductus, pulmonary hypertension, which we have already discussed once. Now, the PO2 is normal, saturation low, we suspect with hemoglobinemia, but you have to rule out other causes as well. Is an example of pan digital clubbing. That's all the five fingers of the hands and feet, and the, and the all five, five uh, 20 fingers of the hands and feet are always club and sinus. This is a pan digital clubbing. The squatting history the child often squats to rest after exertion and may pull up the legs to the chest, and which increases the SVR, the system respiration, and systolic blood pressure. Now, let us tell you that apart from squatting, there are several others, certain others. Uh, signs and symptoms which are known as spell equivalents, like for example, they sit down or they may blow through the this thing, and uh, they may they can have uh, they can have stiffness of the body, which can be a case of I mean, which can be a, a seizure. I mean, a square, so, so, spell equivalent. Congestive cardiac failure: thirty percent of infants and children with CHD have CCF, and ninety percent develop during the first year if they are unattended. What is the earliest sign that the child is having congestive cardiac failure? That is the Change in respiratory pattern. So you see that the cardiopulmonary, uh, cardio and pulmonary ones are actually interconnected. Tachypnea from the word tachys means swift, noia means breathe. If there is rapid shallow respiration with persistently fast rate, unlabeled tachypnea may be overlooked. Count for that, count a full minute 
and restlessness or just crying after a, uh, just after a cry of the feet, the respiratory rate may increase in healthy infants as well. If we check the uh, respiratory rate after just crying or a feed, the respiratory rate is bound to become somewhat increased. This near means manifestation may be due to grunting, alienation, pairing, or retractions. Does the respiration change with physical stress? That should be our question. No. The, does the respiration change with physical stress, like crying, large feeding, or defecation? If the child's respiration really changes physical stress, that means the child is being unable to handle the load. Clinically, there will be increased cyanosis, tachycardia, tachycardia sweating, and decrease or disappearance of the systolic murmur in the due to decreased pulmonary blood flow in case of cyanotic spells. I apologize. I'll just rearrange the slide to show you something here. Dyspnea, whether the child is crying, large feeding, and defecation. What are the causes of dyspnea? Can anyone uh, cooperate with me? What are the causes of dyspnea? Like if we take it uh, ordinary chest x ray and try to figure out the cause of dyspnea, the distended right atrium is pressing on the carina. That's a carina, the distended right atrium is pressing on the carina for due to certain reasons. This is stasis of secretions or leading to atelectasis and infection. Edema of the mucosa with air trapping. Distended array pressing on the uh, carina and compression of the bronchi by dilated tense, high pressure uh, PS. So these are the general causes of dyspnea. The net effects are the child starts coughing and wheezing. There is a predisposition to RTI, respiratory problems may dominate and may contribute to the failure to try increased work of breathing. So this is the way we feed our babies feeling difficulty and FTT because they, that might be one of the main reasons why the child has uh, precipitated, I mean, child is presented because sometimes we might find that the children at one year of age, they might be weighing only four kilos. So much is the, is the malnutrition. So the technia dyspnea lacks energy to suck, dies quickly, interpret feeds, irritable, apparently hungry and lethargic with excessive sleep. Decreased weight gain can be one of the major precipitating factors or major causes of reference. We generally ease about 150 to 200 kilocalories per day in children born with cyanotic heart disease or even any heart disease because there will be extra work of breathing and attempts to increase the volume of the feet may actually precipitate the vomiting. Hence, we should be trading very, very cautiously. Normal infants take out less than 10 meter minute per feet. Infants with congestive cardiac, I mean CCF, they can stay about 30 to 45 minutes and decrease in urine output, inadequate uh, intake and inadequate cardiac output. Large left right short lesions, they can not cause chronic low cardiac output. Why does the oxygen consumption increase? What really happens? Why does the oxygen consumption increase? We can see there is increased muscle oxygenation leading to tachypnea because the oxygen consumption of the respiratory muscles, it hasn't seen. It takes about the oxygen consumption of the respiratory muscles is to the, is to the total resting oxygen consumption. Under the resting condition, the muscles use only less than 5% of the oxygen, but the same muscles will require up to uh, 30% when they are, we are going for increased respiratory efforts or there will be a different pulmonary condition. Paleron sweating, there will be increased sympathetic nervous system activity, increased work of breathing and may be mistaken for anemia. Paleron sweating often is uh, seen even in doctors as well because there, will be, there might be increased sympathetic nervous system activities and uh, which may be mistaken for anemia under the huge tension. Exercise tolerance, in general, remember one golden thing is children will tolerate the exercise even if they are not fit to do so, until and unless they become really tired. Inadequate cardiac output, which carry on even in severe obstruction, there will be raised venous pressure, pulmonary venous pressure, severely reduced pulmonary blood flow, and sensitive fatigue with ischemia of excess muscles. So this can result sometimes in the unfortunate event of sudden death, whereby more than 50% is inactive at that stage. It has been found that more than 50% is actually not doing anything. Only 10% is involved in the active sports, and 16% had a history of syncope. So from the arrhythmias, the most common lethal primary arrhythmias are prolonged QT, catecholamine sensitive BT, atrial fibrillation associated with WPW syndrome and congenital complete heart block. A history of either dizziness or syncope at rest or excess induced and demands importance and further investigations. Whenever you find that the child has a complaint of dizziness or a syncope and there is some amount of excess induced or even at rest, uh, I mean the other industries are not coming normal, 
This demands further importance and further investigations. Important history pertaining to a syncope or palpitations, whether the child was exercising or frightening, whether the, there was in discuss, just discovered the palpitations, they, does it follow any particular pattern? Are these that are you emotionally stressed out and standing for long hours, which can uh, lead to several disorders? In the resting ECG, we should take a, from the ECG counterpart, we should take an ECG where as soon as the patient walks in the OPD, and if the patient is slightly panting, we can take an ECG after exercise and wait to go for it 24 hours full-term monitoring so that we can get a uh, total assumption that what is happening to the rhythm of the patient throughout the last 24 hours. But obviously, for our patients, you, for example, coming with uh, arrhythmias, we always tell them that the particular holter monitor, which, which you are particularly uh, attaching for that period of time, for a particular day, may or may not be able to catch your diagnosis. Because if we are trying to fetch some amount of arrhythmia, that particular arrhythmia may not be available on that particular day that the holter monitor is attached. So we have to just be patient and cool and calm. We can always repeat the holter in two or three on two or three days. Blood pressure has to be checked in two positions, either it's a supine or after standing for 10 minutes. And specifically, we are seeing a lot and lot of hypertension in these stage groups today. Chest pain. Remember that only 4% of the chest pains have an organic cause in children. So the, all the rest, 96% are taken up, they have non-organic causes, or they have been either there has been some hit on the chest or the muscle pain or something else is occurred, which is interpreted as chest pain. Important history should just uh, to remind you, you rule out should rule out osteochondritis, conversion disorders, and depression because often depression, though it is not written in the textbooks, but it can be a manifestation of cardiac disease, especially in the young and adolescent group of people. So structural abnormalities like LVOTO, RVOTO, mitral valve prolapse, coronary abnormalities, acquired myocardial diseases like coronary disease, Kawasaki's and pericardial, and whether there are any arrhythmias. Whether the children, if it is uh, if the child comes back to you and says that there is a funny sensation in the tummy, or uh, or I was having a syncope during that period, then that gives you a clue that probably the child is having some amount of arrhythmias. Medical history, we should see the illnesses, medications, hospitalization, whether the child has been having uh, tuberculosis, or there is history of fever, RTI, sensitive of myocarditis. And irradiation. Immunizations usually. The child, uh, the children will receive immunizations unless there is gross violent uh, uh, going on. Do not withhold the immunizations for routine causes and unless the baby is really critically ill and may, immunization may start six weeks post-operative as soon as possible. Now, the development of CNS, there should, should be coexisting intellectual, perceptual, and motor abnormalities some of the cases. Neurological complications in association with CCHD means brain abscess and stroke, which is more common in less than two years and more with associated, more associated with uh, iron deficiency anemia, and if the saturation is less than 50%. Headaches and bone pain, and persistent severe headache in cooperation, rarely in cerebral arterial aneurysm. Pyrexia, with the, there can be a history of inflammatory diseases like Kawasaki's disease, rheumatic fever, myocarditis, endocarditis, and brain abscess. So never turn away any patient with pyrexia because he doesn't fit into your criteria for admission. So we have to go back in history and find out that whether there's any signs of and symptoms of inflammatory diseases like Kawasaki's, rheumatic myocarditis, endocarditis, or brain abscesses. Dental health can go unrecognized and dental abscess without, uh, without a dental abscess has been taken care of or caries tooth has been taken care of. We usually do not draw surgeries. Procedures and antibiotic prophylaxis. History of pregnancy, only 2% of CHGs have an environmental factor for that also for the first three months and it can be preventable. So the breathing pattern, I are going for a free whole circle. I'll stop at that point today. And so uh, today I discussed the gross examination points. And before that, I discussed about the history, evaluation of the history. What are the particular history we should take so that not to miss any congenital heart disease. Remember, just like in, near, in our country, I think that in your country, that is in Bangladesh also, it's not possible for the doctors to go from home to home and collect the data and tell them which a particular patient has when there's suspicion of congenital heart disease and they can come back. With time, we have developed such a system, but at the same time, we find that the patients, I mean, the persons who are going from home to home may not be the doctors themselves. So we uh, have trained our other doctors who are not in the MBBS curriculum. That's where they, go, they can go to home from, from home to home. They can collect the data. They can collect, uh, they can see that what are the particular problems that the child is having. They can detect cyanosis. They take a, a small stethoscope and they detect whether there is any murmurs or so, and thereafter they refer the patients to us. So the fact that the, this amount of hard work has to be done 
amongst the people so that it's not possible for an individual doctor to go to each and every patient or go to each and every uh, I mean, child who is sitting in the villages. So they have to basically come, but only when the major clinical screen has been done by subsequent authorities who know how to screen the patient. For that, they have to study how do we identify the patient for a suspected congenital heart disease. And what I told today is basically how to identify the congenital heart disease over several signs of symptoms. I've tried to play with different signs of symptoms which may be found at different places at different timings. And thereafter, we had done a gross, gross examination of the cardiovascular system and the review of uh, systems and the I mean, uh, head, to toe for, uh, head to foot examination, uh, we will come later on. So you can give me the answer, ask me the questions which you are already giving. You have finished, Dr. Amitabh. Yes, madam. Oh, it's a very, very interesting one and very long lecture. Dr. Fatima, it is over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amita, for your nice. Dr. Long Fatima, lecture. we can hear you. You can't hear me? What you are, are you? hearing now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I would like to thank Dr. Amita for taking pain for giving such a long lectures on a very difficult issues like uh, how a patient presents. So in his presentation, we have seen that he has divided his presentation in several parts like age-wise presentation and then like symptom-wise presentation and then like examination-wise. And um, he has discussed actually everything which were very important for a students of our MD course and also FCPS course, especially how to do the hyperoxia test, what are the cutoff points for saying some, some diseases, congenital heart disease and to rule out congenital heart disease. So these are the very important basic things everyone should know. How to actually suspect arrhythmia if somebody say there is history of fainting or something. So I think all the students are very much benefited from this, this presentation. And we are actually in our lecture selection, we are going step by step from the easy things to the harder things. So Dr. Romita, we had two presentation before also from our side from congenital heart disease. First Thank one you. were on the structural issues like nomenclature and terminologies. Second one was on guidelines, like some of the guidelines uh, which you Indian people are following and we, we Bangladesh uh, here, we are also following the guidelines for common congenital heart disease. So we discussed those uh, on those issues in previous two lectures. Today you have discussed on how to diagnose, how to suspect congenital heart disease, symptom wise, sign wise. And uh, this, I think this will be very helpful for the beginners and also for the students. And I would be very happy if some of the students can ask question to uh, Dr. Amita, if there is anything they have not understand on the, or they want to know more from Dr. Ravita. Is there okay. any question from any student? Dr. Mufajjal, do you want to ask any question? Unmute please, unmute please. Dr. Amitabh, do you hear me? Yes, tell me please. Oh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. It is a very deliberate lecture from your side. Uh, do you have any protocol in your uh, institution uh, which you follow regarding the uh, co congenital, that is genetic disorder patients? In patients with some genetic yes, disorder. we do have. Yes, I'll tell you. The, I'll answer your questions in two parts. The first part is, see, genetic, genetic disorders is a part and parcel of congenital heart disease. So plenty of congenital heart disease will have some source of information on the genetic causes, especially like if a person has a pulmonary, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, if the same family has three or four brothers and sisters with, say, long QT syndrome, or three or four with the parent and a child with, say, history of sudden cardiac death and HCM, something like that. So what happens is usually the genetic studies 
in our in our city or maybe in our country it takes about inr of 20000 so that is one rate limiting step we whenever we find a patient who has to be suspected of genetic disorders we tell the family that this is the amount of money which you have to spend but this is for your own child because whenever we are spending such amount of money the parents will ask us that what will be of it will it be of benefit to the child itself the answer is no the genetic study will only guide the treatment partly for the child in question but also for the future generation like whether these parents want to take another baby whether their baby will be carrying that same disease or not so this can be found out by that from the genetic studies whether this is the general protocol which we follow we are slightly limited from which are slightly limited in the form of like uh, the money because the genetic test part test is about 20000 so we have to exercise it very very rationally so the cases which really require them we refer for the tests and thereafter when the results come back we do the following i mean uh, uh, whatever is required but we do not thank do the genetic you. test in everyone thank you very much any more question from anyone dr ashwa uh, thank you for an excellent presentation just as an additive what are the genetic diseases you can exclude by those genetic testing uh, just now you have uh, told for 20,000 INR. Yes, you can. We, there are specific panels, and you have to tell, tell the geneticists which panel you are suspecting. For example, if there is pulmonary hypertension, I'll uh, ask the panelist, I mean, ask the geneticist to do the uh, genes, to specifically look for the genes which are which can give rise to pulmonary hypertension. If there is a cardiopathy panel, then we'll tell the ask them. To do the particular genes, which are they have their particular uh, slots and particular I mean, genomes. So we have to look for these uh, particular things, the genetic studies, where we can suspect the congenital heart disease like congenital cardiomyopathy. So there are several ways. Or else, in general, we do the genomic sequence, genomic sequence, and even if they don't, we have to do the I mean other sequences as well. For example, if it's a pompous disease or it's a long QT syndrome, we'll ask them particularly to look for those genes, whether they are present or not, and prognosticate the patient accordingly. That is a protocol which we follow. Thank, Thank you, you, Doctor. Uh, is there any question from anybody else? Um, there is a question in the chat box from uh, Dr. Dapar. Yes. He has asked why ischemia is common in less than two years and brain abscess is common in older children with scientific heart disease complications. Like brain abscess, it doesn't occur alone. Remember, I'll try to answer the second part first. There is an older children with scientific congenital heart diseases that uh, brain abscess is common. See, what happens in extremely scientific patients due to the severe hyperviscosity, severe hyperviscosity as a result of, uh, as a result of cyanosis, this can lead, lead to severe polycythemia and hyperviscosity, or which leads to secondarily brain ischemia and thereafter leading to brain abscesses. That is the most common theory which we know about the leading to brain abscesses. And why ischemia is common in less than two years? Ischemia means as, as such the ischemia to the myocardium and other ones. Is it so, Jabba, that you want to know that uh, whether the ischemia is common in less than two years? Ischemia to which part of the body? Jabbar, is it uh, can uh, can you define? I think he is asking is about. Yeah, sir, yes, sir. sir uh, Dr. Jabbar, can you clear your question? Uh, sir, uh, welcome, sir. Sir, I am uh, asking about why acute ischemia, the acute infarction, the acute stroke syndrome, like presentation, uh, cerebral or uh, ischemia, more common in younger kids, less than two years. <laughs> Okay, I mean the stroke-like episodes in case of uh, cyanosis. Yes. yes. Though yes. the older children and the uh, the older children in general, I mean the smaller children, both will have, yeah. have, yeah. have polycythemia. What happens? The arteries and arterioles and the vessels are extremely narrow in these kind of patients. So even if one particular small area has a polycythemic episode and there is ischemia to that brain, that's the reason the strokes are quite common. But in older children. With polycythemia, with cyanosis, there is some amount of increase in the caliber of the vessels, which leads, though there is hyperviscosity and there will be slow flow, but even then there will be some amount of blood which will be going. So it don't, and with the help of there will be some collaterals which will be developing as well. There will be some amount of extra extra vessels which will be developing. 
this is the reason why even if there is gross polycythemia and the brains are chronically hypoxic as well it has been seen experimentally brains are chronically hypoxic what happens is they do not tend to have severe stroke like episodes but they will have a consequence of chronic hypoxia whereby the secondary infection lead to brain abscess i have one question dr amitab to you yes ma'am Stroke uh, is type of an ASD. Yes, it can be, especially if there is a right to left flow. Generally, in any ASD, there is a left to right flow. So, in by virtual this, the if there is right to left flow due to any reason, then there can be an episode of stroke. The second about PAPVC, there is a right upper pulmonary vein will be streaming to the left side. So during that streaming, if there are at all any thrombus which is going from the right to the left side, then only there can be a patient of stroke. Yeah. Uh, any more question from anybody? Dr. Zahid. Um, Zahid, by you want to ask any question? There's a question. How is insular DCM in our institute? What the lowest presentation how is the outcome yes i'll go in the reverse way the outcome is a mixed one madam specifically we see that in our country and i'm sure in bangladesh also we have several papers from indian bangladesh and one of the very common causes of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy in in these countries is a nutritional deficiency especially of iron especially of vitamin d and calcium and in some cases thyroid deficiency which is metabolic so these are the common causes of dilated cardiomyopathy which are rectifiable so whenever a patient with dcm comes to our institute we tell them that out of the thousand causes there are only 20 causes which we can really rectify either by medications or by surgery so we do the panel of uh, iron profile iron profile vitamin d and uh, calcium and all other factors if it is rectifiable in this uh, cases we usually do it immediately and the lowest i mean how outcome is if there is a metabolic cause then they improve gradually if the cause is a myocarditis, then the uh, the development in the development and coming back to the normal function is slightly doubtful because some of the myocarditis people do come back, but the other people they do not usually recommend to. I mean, uh, some of the people do not recover their function. They usually need supportive therapy in the form of uh, uh, anti failure medications, and in some cases they might have to go for transplant. Also. The other causes which you have said, what is the incidence? The other question was, what is the incidence? Incidence is same everywhere. Maybe about roughly we get about two dilated cardiac patients per month, two to three dilated cardiac patients per month. Surprisingly, in the lockdown period, we didn't find much of a dilated cardiac patient. That might be two reasons. Number one, they couldn't come to the hospital due to the lockdown or the attrition rate. They might have died at home before they could have sought medical help. The lowest age of presentation we have seen for dilated cardiac patients is infants. That is about infants of about eight to nine months. Uh, Dr. Amitabh, another question in the chat box. Are you seeing that question? Source of embolism in yes, uh, sinus. Is it from the SVC or the IVC? In general, madam, SVC or the IVC doesn't harbor clots unless there is something of because SVC or IVC, if they harbor clots, then there will be impedance of the flow itself. So the commonest cause of clot is either, I mean, they are coming from the more than, even than that, they usually come from the lower half of the body, from the IVC, and especially from the leg veins, if they have anything to for the clot mechanism to come back. It usually it's from the legs or deep venous thrombosis, which usually happens in the legs. Intracardiac clots can be rare unless the patient is really having atrial fibrillation or any other Supra-atrial tachycardia, Thank you, thank you, Dr. Amitabh. I just want to add here that about the cardiomyopathy you were talking, uh, we uh, have many newborn and infants, very young infants with dilated cardiomyopathy from the coarctation of aorta, from critical aortic stenosis, and very importantly from yes, the supraventricular tachycardia. There are many newborn babies having supraventricular tachycardia, and these are missed by the uh, NICU people because they, uh, they are not familiar with this kind of situation. And I have seen many cases in our NICU, they were missing SBT, and the, the treatment of SBT is very simple. But 
And yes. the kids are missed very frequently. They lend to us as uh, cardiomyopathy and later we found that this is actually a case of supraventricular tachycardia. So, uh, and uh, very importantly, coarctation of aorta. Critical coarctation is missed in many center and especially by the new pediatric cardiologist or the new one who are doing echocardiography, they usually don't check the neck uh, vessels and also the coarctation. And whenever you will see a dilated cardiomyopathy in a children, you have to look for L-kappa, you have to look for the coarctation of aorta for the critical aortic stenosis, and also sometimes aorto uh, pulmonary like coronary cameral fistula sometimes also cause uh, this situation. Uh, I, I also want to add here that we are getting many MISC patient also with myocarditis followed by cardiomyopathy. So you have to look in this pandemic situation, if you have a patient with cardiomyopathy, you have to ask the history of COVID positive parents in the family or other people, or there was a history of fever or not. So you have to correlate MISC also uh, now in the context of pandemic, because we are getting so many cases of the MISC with myocarditis, with uh, heart failure, with cardiomyopathy. My question to you, Dr. Amitabh is, uh, what is your neonatal screening program? For example, in our institute, we have a neonatal screening program for screening of congenital heart disease. For example, we do echocardiography for all patients of Down syndrome, all patients with other congenital anomalies, all patients with mothers having history of fever and rash during pregnancy, and then history of taking like anticonvulsant drug during pregnancy, like phenytoin or phenobarbitone. So we have a protocol. Uh, and we are seeing that following that protocol, we can identify many, many congenital heart diseases, which we would not have done eco otherwise, because there was no symptom. These patients were asymptomatic, actually. So is there any protocol in your institute like this? Right, ma'am. The, the, I mean, uh, the examples which you have mentioned, we follow the same protocol. We do not have an inbuilt paternity ward here but the patients we get from the neonates we get from uh, elsewhere and we have a neonatal care unit in and the maternity ward in our adjacent other part of the hospital whereby if we have a mother who has any of the criteria which we have mentioned we generally have an echocardiogram done to the baby also if the also i would add to like like to add to this point if the parents have a sibling if the parents have a child who has been suffering from congenital heart disease or, or if the need is a congenital heart is a genetic abnormality in the family also then also we the new unit gets a, a screening obviously for if the new unit has any other metabolic abnormalities or the heart rate is varying or the blood pressures are not holding they will get an economic cardiogram done and also we are getting quite a few of mic patients as well this last week we are going to probably publish a case ma'am we got a heart block as well from uh, cardiomyopathy i'm oh, sorry myocarditis from misc and the, though the function has improved, but the child presented with the complete heart block will stay for about seven days. Yeah, MISC is a uh, great problem nowadays from the COVID. So I think we have finished with uh, all our questions. You have answered all the questions very nicely. And I think all of us have benefited. Uh, we are going to close our session. If anyone wants to say anything, can say. Um, uh, quickly so that we can conclude our session now. Mm. Anybody want to say anything? Um, uh, okay, Dr. Salam. Just uh, actually, I, 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 I uh, heard the lecture of Professor Amitabh. To, uh, Amitabh. Uh, actually, he deliberately and um, um, descriptively uh, mentioned each and every symptom. But even then, some uh, congenital heart problem may uh, remain obscure uh, um, by uh, undetected physician. Uh, particularly like that of the Avarenthi malformation or uh, pulmonary arterial fibula. So some rare thing uh, we may miss. But uh, uh, regarding the screening program, I think the all critical neonate coming to the new uh, ICU, uh, neonatal ICU, should go, uh, should go for an eco screening because it is a, a non invasive test, nothing to uh, harm to the baby. Uh, in our score hospital, we have done, we are doing a study. In general, we have. And uh, my, in uh, nearly. In general, we, we do screen. 
some sort of congenital malformation. It is. Second, the regarding the dilated cardiomyopathy, which I want to say that is the most common cause of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy in our setting is unknown. But we uh, assume that it is due to post-viral myocarditis following that uh, yes. dilated cardiomyopathy develops. And Coxsackie B virus, which is uh, quite um, uh, ubiquitous in our situation. Uh, so this virus isolation from nasal swab is possible, but the kit is not available in our country. Uh, uh, but we just uh, uh, theoretically think of this thing. But giving IVIG therapy within uh, two to three weeks of the onset of the uh, myocarditis or cardiomyopathy, uh, almost uh, more than 70% patient uh, improve uh, 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 even from the um, uh, severe complication. And th this, is, uh, this is one of my study I published uh, uh, that the IVIG therapy in early case of directed cardiomyopathy. Actually, this idea I, uh, I um, uh, I found in some literature also, and uh, although it was not proven by uh, well agreed uh, in all, 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 uh, best of what best of IVIG therapy has some role. Of... Seen the, the, there is a, a um, increase in ejection fraction after giving I, IVIG therapy. Thank you very much. Right, sir. Uh, Doctor Vitabh Chattopadhyay, why you want to hear a comment? Uh, as Professor Ibrahim Abdul Salam has said regarding IVIG therapy. Your comment on what uh, Professor Ibrahim Abdul Salam has said. Sir, IVIG therapy still remains a, an enigma and a little bit controversial. Like if we read several several uh, studies which shows that IVIG therapy for myocarditis and uh, myocarditis is uh, well established and they have got several results. Like there has been series publications of say 60 or 70 patients in some series and they have got beautiful results whereby the mainly the cardiac function has recovered but at the same time the i mean the statistical analysis have shown some of the statistical analysis have shown that there has been equivalent results with either uh, giving ivig or by giving steroids or immunosuppressants now the form of treatment for myocarditis is slightly controversial at one hand we are preferring ivig will boost the immunity at the other hand we are preferring steroids which will actually suppress the immunity so the actual pathophysiology of the myocarditis, whichever is shown, there is edema of the vessels, I mean, of the uh, myocardial cells, which uh, probably is mediated by inflammation. So in these two cases, we are giving a two-pronged attack. In one attack, we are giving, we are actually boosting the immunity, the other one, we are actually suppressing it. But nevertheless, IVIG does work and it has been proven beyond doubt in most of the cases. Though the meta-analysis which came out about four to five years back, it, show, it has failed to show any significant improvement, statistical improvement, statistically significant improvement with IVIG alone. But nevertheless, I think the countries like us, we always would like to give deliver IVIG because for the benefit of the patient. Now, what Dr. Salam said that there has been improvement in the function with IVIG. Yes, I believe so. And personally speaking, in our institute, we still provide IVIG to the patient except the fact that it's highly costly and it drains the parents that because if the fishery is the baby is big two gram per kilo it actually is quite costly for the patient so if they can afford we definitely give IVIG. thank you thank you everyone and dr amitabh about the ivig there is time bar also you have to give it if you find the patient in first week and if you can uh, at least by two weeks of uh, onset of the disease otherwise uh, there will be no use of IVIG. So with this, we are going to end our program today. We have an announcement for the next week. Next week, uh, the, our class will be on general guidelines of management of congenital heart disease. And speaker is same, Dr. Amitabh Chattopadhyay. So we are inviting you to join our lecture class on next Friday at 4.30 p.m. Bangladesh time and 4 p.m. Indian time. Thank you all for joining today's session. Stay safe and assalamu alaikum. Thank you, ma'am. Thank okay. you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam.
Thanks. <laughs>